Good morning. I'm going to read the scripture text for Blake's sermon today. Thank you, Scott, for the invitation. First reading is from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And I'm reading from the New International Translation. The boy Samuel ministered before Yahweh under Eli. In those days, the word of Yahweh was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of Yahweh where the ark of God was. And then Yahweh called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and he said, Here I am, you called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and he lay down. Again Yahweh called Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. And Eli said, My son, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Give an old man his night's sleep. Sorry, my son. <laughs> Now Samuel did not yet know Yahweh. The word of Yahweh had not yet been revealed to him. So Yahweh called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. And then Eli realized that Yahweh was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Yahweh, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and laid down in his place. Yahweh came and stood there calling us at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. The second reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 5 and going through verse 12, and the words of Paul. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our, in our hearts and to give us the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to the death for Jesus to save, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us. Life is at work in you. This is the reading of God's holy word that grant us understanding this morning. Well, good morning, church. It's great to be with you today. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you uh, yesterday and to hear from so many of your pastors who have served you in the past and to be reminded about the many ways that God has blessed you these past 65 years. As you've had a great, uh, a great partnership, a great mission focus, all the things that were shared yesterday. And I also was so impressed with the ways in which the past was shared, but also the hopes for the future and where you are now and where you're intending to go. I appreciated uh, Pastor Scott. Thank you for inviting me to be here today, both yesterday and today. Uh, I'm still full from yesterday. <laughs> it's fantastic. And, uh, and I also appreciated what you shared uh, about the, the visioning and mission and values that you guys have been working on as you're thinking of positioning yourself for the future. And I pray that this message might uh, be fully aligned with all that, uh, that you have done already. And you will see the spirit kind of deepening and growing that emphasis. So let's pray today. <coughs> Loving and gracious God, it is so great to be together. I pray that uh, the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts will be acceptable to you. Collectively, Lord, we say <clears throat> together in this worship service, speak, Lord. We, your servants, are to Amen. Well, happy 65th. <laughs> 65 uh, in my life growing up was always kind of a milestone number. 
And the reason is, when I was growing up, 65 was always the age people talked about retiring. And I think that's the reason for that, I think, is because uh, it's, it, at that point, when I was growing up, it was the full retirement age for Social Security, I believe. I think now it's 67 or something like that. It's not 65 anymore. But, but 65 was always kind of, whether people actually retired at that date or not, that, that was always kind of the retirement age. And so uh, it's always been kind of a, a, a milestone thing for me just to think about that. You know, in, in life, in human life, there's a normal cycle to our life. There's the period of birth and childhood and youth and adult, where we're learning and growing and developing and finding our identity, being equipped for the ways in which we're going to be engaged in the world. Yes? Then there's this period of uh, adulthood where we're engaged in however we're engaged with the career, with family, with work, with volunteer stuff. That's our active kind of life, we call it. And then 65. <laughs> and we retire. And we have this period, however long it is, of retirement until God calls us home. This cycle of uh, this beginning, maybe 25 years, this middle, maybe 40 years, and then this retirement place, however many years. Funny thing, you know, uh, the Bible doesn't know really anything about retirement, does it? You ever notice that? Retirement isn't a thing in the Bible. <laughs> it's become a thing in kind of our, our kind of the way we think of our own life cycle. But in the Bible, you know, I mean, my goodness, Moses didn't even get started until 80. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, they were promised, you know, uh, descendants as the stars in the sky. They didn't really get started until they're. 90s. Abraham was 100. And so, uh, though we think of these segments, these cycles, uh, it's interesting that the Bible thinks of it differently. In my life, you know, um, the people that I have known, I've known many people in my life who, in the church, who have retired and who have, who have retired well. And when uh, I, I look at what's common in their life, for most of them, they don't think of it so much as a retirement. Yeah, they think of, of stopping some way journey work. But they often think of it not as a retirement, but as a refirement. They feel re-engaged. The passions that God has been working on them in their life, that have developed over their life now, they're able to focus on those passions, those callings even more directly, and align their spiritual center with their active life. And those who have done that have done that well, long past those 65 years of their, of their life. They've discovered a new fire a new passion, a new energy, a new focus for life. Churches have their own cycles, don't they? And it's similar to a human life cycle. There's a period of beginning, a time of birth, and that birth is often an, an explosion of the spirit. It's like, a, it's like a fire is lit, yes? And that fire then spreads and develops, and there's an energy to it, and there's a growth to it, and there's a, there's a dynamic nature to it. And the church is launched. And then there's a period in which that fire is stoked <laughs> through, uh, through kind of more normal means of keeping that fire going as the church becomes more established and has greater impact and influence in the community and people's lives. Right? And then, here's that cycle, the, 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 that fire, that energy begins to dim. It's normal. You have this beginning passion and explosion. You have this, this extension and deepening. And then it's natural for it to be the fire to begin to start to dim. And at this point, what's needed? A refire. A new beginning. Another Pentecost. And when you look at a church, and a church that's been around for a long time, decades, centuries, been vital for many, many generations, you see, that you don't see this, right? You see this, <laughs> right? Because at each of those points, what's, what's required is a, is, a, is, a, is a rediscovery of the love we had at first. Church in Ephesus wrote on Revelation 2.4, remember the criticism about that church was that they lost the love they had at first. And that's what happens when we refire. We recapture the love we had at first. Now, the we may mean our ancestors, by the way, not just us. But there was a fire. There was a, a burning. There was a spiritual explosion that happened that sustained something. And that needs to be discovered anew again and being launched in a, in a, in a, in a new way. 
So I'm going to talk to you today about this <laughs> beginning. 65 years, good time as any, right? To refire, to reignite, to find uh, all that's been blessed in the past, and to find that as new territory for the future. Now, to refire requires the eyes, the ears, and the body. And when I refer to the body, I'm referring to, yes, your body, but I'm also referring to your body. Right? So think body meaning your body and Aldersgate, the church, because the church is your bodies together. Your church is the body of Christ. You are the church. You are the body collectively. You are the body of Christ. So think both ways. Think personally about your own body, but think about the body of the church as well. It requires the eyes and the ears and the body. Pastor Scott read to you that Eli's eyes in 1 Samuel had grown dim. But that's not just a comment on Eli and his age and his vision, right? It was a comment about the people in general. Their eyes had grown dim. There was no visions being seen. To refire, you must see a vision. You must see God's vision. No vision, no fire. Jesus often says, for those of you who have eyes to see and ears to hear, why does he say that? If you have eyes to see and ears to hear, then you'll learn not. Because yes, we have eyes, and yes, we have ears, but we don't always see, even when it's right in front of us, and we don't always hear, even though God's speaking all the time. God is constantly being revealed every day, in all situations of our life, God is constantly speaking into our ears, but it's very common for us as human beings not to see it and not to hear it. And so to refire, we must be able to see again, to see anew. All right, I brought a test. Okay, this is a memory test. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you something on this paper, just quickly, don't say, don't say anything, just, just look at it. And remember it, okay? Thoughts? You ready? Yeah. I got. I got to run around the room here. So I'm going to show you this real quickly. Don't say a thing. Just look at it. And remember, I want to see if you remember what it is when I get done showing the picture. Okay? Here it is. Okay? There it is. You all see that? Okay. Wait a second. Hold it. See how long you remember? You mind remember it? <laughs> okay. I showed you. I'll give you a hint. Two cards. The card on the left. What was that card? Your left or our left? <laughs> it's your left. The left. You're looking at your left. Six of spades. And what was on the right? Four hearts. Four hearts, right? Six of spades, four hearts. Simple, right? <laughs> that is not a spade. That is not a heart. For those who have eyes to see, let them see. You see why you said that? Did they teach you that trick? No, no. I didn't change anything on you. Why couldn't you see what was right in front of your eyes? Because the mind, as human beings, the mind organizes things. The mind has preconceptions. The mind has paradigms that it uses. You know there's no such thing in a deck of cards as a black heart. So your mind immediately knows what it's looking at and goes to seeing what's not there. Because you formed a preconceived notion about what you're going to see. Because this looks like a regular playing card. It is not. But you can't see it. God's vision is often right in front of our faces. Being revealed as clearly as that heart is the heart and that's spade. But we can't see it. Because we've got some lenses on that distort the reality that, that, that think we know what we're already seeing. And those lenses that we put on or lenses that we get because of our ideologies, our politics, our 
culture, our background, our education, the narratives we listen to, the, 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 the online stuff we look at and read, the things we hear on the radio, the things we watch on television, all these narratives are forming lenses for us to view the world at. And yet there are lenses that distort often or blind us to what God is actually doing right in front of our faces. That's why Jesus says, if you have eyes to see. Now, the eyes he's talking about are the eyes of the gospel. Now, what most of us do as human beings, we have many lenses on, and then we reach for the gospel to uh, give authorization to what we already want to see. Right? To, to, to confirm our prejudice, to confirm our own, you know, distortions. To confirm our own views and our ways. That's normal. We all do that. We look for validation for what we're seeing. No. What, what we're called to do is to put the primary lens on, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's unavoidable to have the lenses, by the way. It's just human. But we want to look at the other lenses through the gospel, not the other way around. Those who have eyes to see, let us... Let us see that the lens we seek to put on is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's his birth. It's his life. It's his death. And it's his resurrection. And it's that narrative. It's that story which opens up the whole of scripture to us that allows us to see God in our midst. God is with us. Can you see it? You need the gospel to see it. You need the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to see it in all the ordinary parts of our lives. If we're going to refine, if we're going to reignite, we need the lens of the Gospels. We need to see again. And we need to see what God is doing. God's doing everything. God is everywhere. You can't look this way, you can't look that way. If you have the Gospel lens on, not see God. God's not hidden. God is revealed. God is a light. God is, God is, God is you know, out there. And so, in our midst, we need eyes to see. Now, the same thing is the problem with the ears. Same problem, right? <laughs> Jesus said also, if you have ears to hear, let them, let them hear. As, as our eyes sometimes don't see what's right in front of us, our ears often don't hear God calling us. God speaking our name. Samuel. Samuel. What do you want, Eli? <laughs> Samuel. Samuel. God is calling your name. It's not just, hey, anybody out there? <laughs> God calls us by name. Samuel, Samuel, Blake, Blake, Clark, Clark, <laughs> Jim, Jim, Scott, Scott, right? All of us by name. It's not a general call. It's a specific call. And when you and I hear that call, that voice of God calling our name, not as a list of things to do, first of all, God calls us by name and then waits. God didn't give Samuel a bunch of instructions. I just said, Samuel, Samuel. I'm waiting for Samuel to say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. God is calling your name. And if you hear that call, and collectively as a congregation say, Lord, speak, your servants are listening. It's personal and it's also corporate. Again, then we begin to catch the spirit in a new way. God is calling you personally. The love of God, the love of Christ is for you and it's for you. Can you hear it? It's a personal address. When we hear God's call, when we encounter the living God, that's how we come alive. That's how we are renewed. That's how we begin a new cycle of the Spirit's movement in our life. If uh, my wife Peggy were to call me right now, and I, weren't, I, didn't look at who was, I didn't look at who was calling, I just answered it, and I put it to my ear, and she said, hello, do you think I'd be able to identify her voice? Yes. Absolutely. Mind me, huh? You can't get I know it like that. Why is that? I mean, I talk to her every day in person. I talk to her every day usually on the phone. I know what her voice sounds like because I hear it so often. Right? 
I probably know some of your voices a little bit. I don't know how often. I know uh, Neil and I have had, I've heard Neil speak a lot in the, over the last 40 years of my ministry. I've talked to him in person. I think I've talked to you once or twice on the phone. It may take hello, Blake. I might get it. <laughs> now, some of you have not talked to before. I don't know what your voice sounds like. If you were to call me, I, I have no idea who you are. You'd have to tell me who you are. We become, it's easy to identify and hear the voice of those that we're accustomed to hearing. And so the more we hear God's voice, the more we can identify God's voice when it calls. The more we are with others who've heard God's voice and who share what God's voice sounds like, the more we can identify what that is. The more we lead, read about in our tradition of people who've heard the voice of God before, and we hear about what that was like, the more we can identify God's voice. The more we read the scriptures and hear how God has spoken to people through the scriptures, and hear how God sounds in the scriptures, we can begin to hear and identify God's voice amongst all the noise. Right? God's voice sounds like Jesus. The Word made flesh. God's self-communication to us. The voice of God never sounds not like Jesus. If you've heard the voice of God, and you can't imagine Jesus ever thinking or saying <laughs> such a thing, it's probably not the voice of God. Yes. It's amazing how many things we attribute to God's voice. You could never square with Jesus, yes. his life, his death, his teachings, his resurrection. The voice of God sounds like Jesus. You know what God looks like? God looks like Jesus. Jesus is God's revelation to us, and he opens up the other ways God has revealed himself to us. So can you, do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Because if the Lord doesn't speak, if God doesn't reveal, there's no fire. We don't create the fire. Now, I'm all for planning, doing assessments, strategizing. All those stuff can open us up to new things God may be saying to us. But we can do all those things perfectly, have a great plan, but if God doesn't speak, we don't hear. If God doesn't reveal, we don't see. There's no fire. There's no new beginning. There's no new Pentecost. Because it's about the Spirit of God who's a real presence in our lives. It's essential. We can go through the motion, but you can't get past being able to see and being able to hear what God is saying. So the eyes. The ears, most importantly, the body. Because once we see, oh, God's doing it. Once we hear, like, like, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. And then God speaks. So I see and I hear. Now what needs to take place is I need to then embody that message. And that message is Christ. I need to embody the living Christ and live it out in the world. Yesterday, Pastor Scott talked to this, I'm using a different language, he used the language of being the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. What I'm talking about here, the embodiment of what we see and what we hear, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says, we have this treasure in clay jars, and at the end, and then at verse 10 he says, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. Body, bodies. <laughs> I'll just speak personally. We embody Christ. Christ lives through us. No longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Paul says somewhere else. Christ lives through us. But when we see and we hear, we, we, we receive Christ. Not just a good thought, not just a good philosophy, not just a good theology. We receive a living presence through the power of the Holy Spirit, and that's where the fire is, yes? That's where the ignition happens. Okay, now I want to go one more place with you. This is the, this is the key. Okay? But we need to be at the point where we're seeing and hearing. And we're saying, Lord, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. And we're seeking to have the life of Christ to be embodied in us. Okay, one more step here. This is really important. This is the key. And Paul says, right before he says, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies, what did he say? He says, what do we do? We carry in our body, listen now, the death of Jesus. 
so that the life of Jesus may be made divine. See, here, embody, embody the death of Jesus. Be put to death the sin in our life. Be put to, to death our pride. Be put to death our self-righteousness. He puts to death, he puts to death our, our need to retaliate or to be condemning or to judge, right? Notice Christ, uh, a little tangent here. <laughs> Evil is a cycle, like violence. It's just a cycle. You hit me, I'm th I feel justified in hitting you back. And then when I hit you back, I knock you over, and I, 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 I hit you into somebody else, and now you were innocent sitting there, you got hit, you go, right then you go, wait a minute, I was innocent here, and then you kind of return. And it goes over and over. This is how violence happens. Everybody feels justified. Everybody feels righteous, actually, that I'm just responding to your evil or to your aggression. And we retaliate, and we feel like, like retaliation is justified. That's not the way of Jesus. Jesus breaks the cycle. He absorbs it. He absorbs the sin and the violence and he puts it to death. He doesn't react. He acts. Right? And so when we, when we absorb, when we, when we have the, when we embody the death of Jesus, he puts to death all that's in us that is not of God. And he causes us not to react but to act by God's nature. We become Christ in the world. We become a, a vehicle of the light of God in the world, shining in the darkness. We, we break cycles of violence and sin and other things in our injustice in our life by absorbing it and depositing it at the cross. God, that's yours to do with. We're taking it out of the world. The death of Jesus. Now, what happens when we die with Jesus? We rise with him. There is a life. If you die with him, if, he, if his death comes to live in your body, you rise with him. There's the fire. There's the refire. That's it. <laughs> his resurrection. We die. We rise. New Pentecost. New energy. Knew everything. Thanks for what has been it's allowed us now to, to go again. So I just have a question for you. Do you have eyes to see? Together, will you continue to help each other put the gospel lenses on for your worship, for your Bible studies, for your fellowship, for your teaching, for your examples, for your, for your, for your service? Continue to help each other as a community. Continue, and you have been, to continue to put those gospel lenses on. Do you have eyes to see? Do you have ears to hear? Do you hear your name? It's important to this church that you hear your name being called. Not just some general call, but your name. The church is built on each one of you hearing your name being spoken by the living God. And for you then, in, in, in the strength of this community, to be able to say together, speak, Lord, your servant's listening. And once you see and have eyes to see, once you have ears to hear, you say, Christ, come to live in me. I embody the death of Jesus. For you that all that is not of God, that I might rise with him, that we might rise with him. Happy 65th. <laughs> Time to refine.